This is an Evergreen Media Network studio production. Broadcasting from the Evergreen Media Network studios in Vero Beach, Florida. It's Hunting with Heather. Hey, y'all. Welcome back to Hunt with Heather. This is Season 1, Episode 15, Part 2. And if you didn't listen to Part 1, you need to go back and catch up because you're going to... You're going to learn a lot of information. So my guest is uh, Mr. Jason Hart. And um, we have been talking all kinds of turkey. Um, he has been educating us on the turkey. And we've been talking conservation. Um, so we left off on conservation and how important it is um, with our youth or just getting people involved in hunting. And like, again, they don't have to hunt, but maybe just stay outdoors, right? So they know this is our future generation. But I really wanted to point out something because I saw this this morning and Mossy Oak put a little documentary out. And I didn't get the, you know, it's yep. just a short, it's a short little clip. It's coming out in April, beginning of April. And I'm not gonna lie, it was very, very moving. And um, as a turkey hunter, I mean, I've only been, tur yes, see, that's it. So it's the, the Colonel and the Fox. So it's a Mossy Oak documentary, The Colonel and the Fox, and it says the greatest generations fight to save the greatest game bird. Like, it really just gives me chills. If you got to watch the video. If you guys haven't, who's listening to this, watch the clip. I cannot wait for the full documentary to come out because I got literally this morning, it was probably like four o'clock this morning. I was like, man, I had to wipe my eyes. It was, it was, <laughs> you can feel it. Yeah, we, uh, I mean, you know. I, oh yeah. No, it's really cool. It's uh, uh, the, the Hayes brothers who are the sons of the founder of Mossy Oak came up with this idea three years ago and they, uh, they recruited a gentleman by the name of Nathaniel Maddox, who, owns a video production company called Slate and Glass. And I'd first met Nathaniel on a turkey hunt in Immokalee, Florida, back in uh, 2019. And he is a very, very, very talented film producer. And he's eat up with turkey hunting, absolutely eaten mm. up with it. And he's really one of the best producers in the business as far as videographers. And, uh, and, and so the Hayes brothers really wanted to do a documentary about their papa, Mr. Fox Hayes. And when they introduced Mr. Mr. Fox Hayes to Mr. Excuse me, to Colonel Tom Kelly, who was known as the poet laureate of turkey hunting, who wrote kind of the turkey <laughs> hunting Bible called the 10th Legion in 1973. They introduced these two gentlemen to each other in their nineties uh, in a turkey hunting camp and let them turkey hunt together. And they uh, they actually grew up a couple blocks from each other, and they're the same age in Mobile, Alabama. And they both took two extremely different paths in life. And even though they grew up in the same neck of the woods, they are uh, they never met each other. But both of them were very instrumental in the development of modern spring turkey hunting. Uh, one from really the conservation side, and one from the really the popularity. Of the sport and that, and the, I, I, I don't call it a sport, it's called a sport slash art. But uh, in addition, this, this documentary is a little bit different. It's just not about two guys, it's about how their generation mm -hmm. uh, basically saw a need for, uh, for conservation. And that during that time, it's, it's pretty cool. Nathaniel, I, I, I'm not going to give too many tips about mm -hmm. it, but he went to over 100 different sources to get clips. And he used over 31 government agencies to get video from. And it's it was way, the trailer is really cool and, and pretty emotional. Yes. But it's a lot more than what's the trailer. It's an hour and 15 minute long documentary. And it's really going to be the, the biggest uh, documentary, really in the history of turkey hunting, that's ever come out. So Mossy Oak's very, very proud of it. It's going to be launching uh, the first week of April on Mossy Oak Go app, as well as Mossy Oak's YouTube. And then... We're having uh, various film previews across the country. There's been two uh, in kind of areas where turkey hunting's kind of near and dear. So it's going to be, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, I got to see it. I got to see it two weeks ago in person on a big screen in West Point, Mississippi. And it's, uh, it's really neat. So that's all yeah. I'm going to say about it. I don't want to spoil it for anybody. Did have, has the uh, Colonel and uh, have they been able to see it? 
Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. I believe they have. So that's awesome. They're both, um, you know, they're both getting to that age where they were right. unable to attend the, the previews, but mm-hmm. it's, uh, it's, it's pretty cool. So yeah, I encourage I'm everybody excited. to check it out. And it, uh, it tells the story of the wild turkey over the last hundred years in America. So it's pretty I neat. love it. Well, I will make sure to, um, you know, when it comes out, I'll make sure to put it up on my social media as well, because I want everyone to see it and um, know just just what it means, yeah, you know, because, yeah, yeah, for sure. Really cool. Yeah, absolutely. So, so let's talk a little bit about um, something pretty huge, which um, a lot of turkey hunters don't get the opportunity to achieve, which is the uh, super slam. Um, and yeah. for... For those who don't know what the Super Slam is, it's all a, a harvest the turkey and register it in all the lower 49 states, correct? Correct. There's uh, there's there's huntable wild turkey populations in 49 out of the 50 states of America. There's not a huntable population in Alaska. So yeah, it was uh, it was something that for the first time got done back in. Back in the 90s, and uh, Mr. Rob Keck, who was the CEO of NWTF, did it. And um, here in the last few years, it's become a little bit more attainable and easier based on the Internet and based on, uh, you know, a lot more knowledge out there. It's gained a lot of popularity. But, no, I, um, I back about 2007, um, I kind of came up with the idea that it would be really cool to do it. And then in 2013, my buddy who uh, we talked about it, how neat would it mm-hmm. be? Uh, he'd been turkey hunting all over the country. He passed away in 13. And I said, you know what? I need to take this serious and do this before I die because I love turkey hunting. And um, I have the opportunity being a single man and uh, having a job that allowed me to network throughout the entire country and having folks that I'd work with um, at various parts of it, in the hunting industry at very um, at various capacities in my career, uh, mainly being in sales. I kind of knew people in really everywhere to go. And uh, so, yeah, I really got serious about it um, uh, at the end of 2013 and then uh, finished in 2021 in Mississippi. That was my final state. So, so yeah, it was really cool. I've, uh, it's uh, At the time, I think I was one of the about the first 20 people to do it. Wow. Since then, there's been a lot and there's a lot more chasing it. But, it, uh, yeah, it was fun to do and it, um, it was a lot of planning, a lot of time and a lot of money. <laughs> So uh, I, I joke and people have asked me how much money I spent on it when I was doing it. I got no idea, but I can tell you, uh, I probably live in a house probably twice as big as what I live in had I not done it because it was, uh, it was sure. expensive, took a lot of time, but it's, uh, it, was, it was certainly fun, certainly proud of it. And anybody that does it, regardless of how they do it, whether they do it on public land or whether they do it with outfitters or whether they do it, and mine was a combination of public land, private land, uh, Native American uh, reservations. Uh, and so I kind of did it in lots of different places and it was just networking and, uh, it takes a lot of time and awful lot of planning and a lot of miles and a lot of, uh, a lot of time away from home for sure. But it was something that uh, I'm certainly proud of did. And it was a lot of fun. That's, that's huge. And I know that I watched a little, little film or documentary they did for you and, um, which was awesome to watch. And, um, and it was so cool to see, I believe, if I'm correct, your your last bird was Mississippi with your correct, buddy's yes. gun. With your buddy's gun, correct? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was. It was it was pretty cool. It was uh uh Mississippi. I had I'd missed the turkey in Mississippi and it was the summer of two thousand nineteen and I was in Orlando at the ICAST fishing show and my friends, the Hayes brothers, I was working for Hook and Nomad at the time. They'd asked me how many states I had left and I'd I think I had 17 states left at that time, and Mississippi was one of them. They're like, you haven't finished Mississippi. You've got to finish in Mississippi with Mossy Oak. So I got to hunt with my friends at, uh, at Mossy Oak for my last one. I say that intentionally, intentionally for the last. It wasn't easy. It was tough. But, uh, but yeah, I used my buddy Guthrie, passed away his gun for, uh, for number 49. So he's sitting right here in my living room right now. So it was, uh, it was oh, a lot of fun. It. But that video, that documentary was uh, – made by my buddy Steven Spurlock, who's a filmmaker, an incredible filmmaker himself, who provided a lot of footage for the Colonel and the Fox and his uh, his company's Chasing 49. So that's the, uh, if you're interested in watching it, he's got, uh, he's on all social ma- media is Chasing 49 and YouTube. And so, so it was fun. It, uh, it was, it was neat that uh, they recognized me and documented it, but it yeah. was, uh, it was quite a good time for sure. So it was, uh, 
Um, uh, That's once a I huge finished it, it kind of changed turkey hunting, and it was uh, it made things a little bit different, a little less goal oriented, which uh, kind of the the idea of grand slams and the idea of the U.S. slam, which I didn't realize at the time, but uh, goal oriented turkey hunting or really any kind of goal oriented hunting um, is a double edged sword. It's fun yep. when you have the passion and the drive to do it, but it also takes away a little bit from the things that you love about hunting, like spending time in camp with buddies. And although I got to spend meet new camp, meet new friends, I missed out on a lot of, a lot of cool experiences, uh, hunting random States like Rhode Island or, you know, Oregon or, or things like that. So, but, uh, yeah, but yeah it's, uh, it's, it's fun. So I get a lot of questions, uh, get a lot of questions about that. And, and, sure. Uh, you know, trying hunting turkeys in, uh, in, it's, it's pretty crazy. People say, where's your favorite place to hunt? And it's Florida, but people also ask what were some of the toughest States and everybody's experience is different. Some of the toughest States there are to turkey hunt in America, like, uh, you know, that have, um, smaller population States like Arkansas and States like Louisiana. You know, I finished those in a half a day. I just got pure lucky. And then mm. other states, which typically used to, that during that time, were easier, like Nebraska, were harder for me. Um, and a state like Arizona was really hard for me. But uh, but it's uh, it's definitely definitely great memories all around. And I love hunting. You know, there's there's not any states I don't love, even though some of the New England states get a little bit tricky because you <laughs> you don't get to hunt in big wilderness areas. You have to hunt in suburban and people's backyards and be conscious of not trespassing and being so far from dwellings. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty fun. And it's also, you know, it was really neat just to see to, to, to traveling as far as hunting is concerned. I really like it just cause it's, you get to see different terrains, you get to meet different kinds of people, different cultures. And, uh, and, you know, America is pretty awesome place. And, uh, and, and, you know, having the ability to travel a lot of it, uh, to to chase chase critters or is really fun but also there's turkeys in other places like that picture yeah. you're posting right is yeah this in is mexico, just, down in oh. the U- yeah that's in the, yeah that's down in mexico which crazy enough mexico is one of my favorite places to hunt too so uh and canada so there's um there's turkey hunting opportunities there too so i that's like i like chasing oscillated. critters all over right that's the correct oscillated. that's the oscillated wild turkey oscillated okay correct now it, is it, it true it, that you do have to well, sorry. So, is it true that I I don't know? Do you shoot them out of the roost there? No. Or do you sh- no? You can't. No? Some, okay, some out, you can't. Some outfitters do, and okay. that was the traditional way of them learning how to hunt. But I've been, I have been on them. Um, I've harvested five, and the outfitters that I've hunted with refused to hunt them off the roost. Um, the way that we have hunted them is using calling methods, which it's nobody has figured out how to replicate the sound of the oscillated male from a um with a, like a handheld device like what we call wild turkeys or a mouth operated device they use speakers and use say a turtle box or a, right. a, a, some type of speaker to call to them but um you hunt them their season opens in february and goes through may and basically these these turkeys live in the jungle of the you can put Yucatan Peninsula, and really the only place to hunt them right now, to my knowledge, they're in Guatemala, but the state of Campeche in Mexico is where you hunt them, and they live in the jungle, but they feed in these agriculture fields. Um, There's a lot of the land owned, owned, owned by the Mennonite religion down there. And you'll hunt on the border of these fields. So they're, when the when the turkeys are going from the jungle to the fields is a lot of times how you hunt them. And on the edge of the fields as they come in from the jungle. So they are a very wary turkey. Um, a lot of people say they look like a peacock. That just they based do. on their coloration. But they're they're you know they they're they're very much like a wild turkey that we have in the United States. Except I think that they're more wary um, because they, where they live in the jungle, they have a lot of big cats that are their predator. Mm. And so they are very wary. For example, an Osceola or an Eastern or a Rio Grande wild turkey or a Marion's, you can get away sometimes with picking up your gun to shoot one. You can't get away with that with an oscillated. They scatter like a covey of quail. Their instinct is not to putt and look at you and then take off running. They scatter like quail. Uh, so it's a really, really neat, fun, fun experience. They're not, um, all of the, the five subspecies of the wild turkey in North America can breed amongst each other, but the the oscillated is a different species in itself. But they make a different vocalization. They don't gobble 
they have what's called a song yeah. it sounds it's very loud it's really neat it's a really bass sounding sound you can google it on youtube and find it but they do have similar behaviors as far as their breeding in that they the males strut uh, they do make different sounds to attract the females and then uh you know they they go and uh, their strut is a little bit different than ours they go it's a little more elaborate but they are very very cool so they're very much a wild turkey and um down in the jungles where we were staying we were actually staying in the jungles we uh we got to eat everything we shot and uh, the mexicans were making incredible dishes and they taste very similar to what an os- osceola or what an eastern or other wild turkey it tastes like so they're delicious that's awesome um so with that when you were talking about um calling them in so with our traditional um, turkeys here I see in a lot of your videos you use a box call, but do you is there a specific mm-hmm. like particular one that you like to use, or do you use them all, or what is I mean, which what is your favorite? I do. So my turkey vest weighs absolutely too much, and I carry way too much stuff in the woods. But yeah, <laughs> I'm a big I'm a big box call uh, person. I um, I love using a box call. I collect box calls and I collect custom box calls, and. Uh, as far as brands are concerned, there's tons of different brands out there. Most of the times, the ones I carry are custom made. Um, I use different custom turkey call makers. One, a gentleman from Florida uh, named Lamar Williams is a very well-known custom call maker. I carry his calls, and he was uh, a protege of uh, kind of the guy that's known as the Stradivarius of turkey call makers, a gentleman by the name of Neil Koss that passed away um, 21 years ago, but, uh, Lamar's are great. I use another friend of mine named Steve Mann out of South Carolina that learned from Neil Cost. I have a, a good buddy named Brett Oswald from South Carolina, another friend, TJ Williams, uh, but I, I, I collect calls, but, uh, all, but if you go down to your local Bass Pro Shops or, uh, independent retailer and find a box call, they, they obviously work absolutely just as good. And I collect a lot of those, but outside of a box call, yes, I, I carry lots of different diaphragm mouth calls with me. I carry friction calls like a slate or a glass or a crystal or aluminum. I carry numerous strikers with me. And then I've also gotten into uh, carrying a trumpet call, which is similar to a wing bone call that uses mm-hmm. a suction motion. But basically I found that, you know, a turkey, uh, uh, a particular turkey on a particular day might like the sound. If you carry 20 calls with you, he might like the sound of one and come to that whereas another day that same turkey might like the sound of a different call and if i ever hunt a turkey and i spook him with one call i'll never use that call on him again um you know i think every um you know hen sounds different a lot of times if i hear local hens i'll try to mimic what they sound like uh to the best of my my ear ability i'm by no means a musician and i um, i'm by no means the best turkey caller out there there's uh, folks that compete at the uh, at both the state level and the grand national level, which is what they call the NWTF's turkey call uh, competition, the grand national. And those people are absolutely incredible. They sound better than a lot of the real hens out there. Mm-hmm. But you don't have to sound great to call up turkeys. You uh, there's lots of resources out there, but you don't real but realize you don't have to you don't have to compete in these contests to be able to kill them. Um, like I said, I've never competed in those contests. Um, I can certainly hold my own and I try to get better. I listen to YouTube videos and listen to audio books of different callers to always try to get better and learn new techniques. And I like hunting with other, other turkey callers. And and many times the best sounding caller isn't the one that kills the most turkeys. It also has a lot to do with woodsmanship and knowing the, uh, you know, knowing the terrain. And when it comes down to it, if you can be where that turkey wants to be, then you're going to have a lot better shot of killing that turkey than calling him to where he doesn't want to go. So um, calling is just a small fraction of the of the of the total tactic that that is turkey hunting. Absolutely, but man, there is something about it though. When you're calling and oh, then yeah. they're well, responding, and I mean it, and they obviously are like, yeah, the, like you just. And you, you call a little oh, yeah. bit, and then they keep calling, and then you can hear them um, get closer and closer and closer. Yep. Heather, you get it. That's what's so special about turkey hunting is you're having a you're having a conversation with a wild turkey, 
and you don't really know exactly what you're saying, but you know whatever you're saying when it's good and he's coming to you, you know, that that's it's it's really cool. It's really special to have a have a have a, a literally a language conversation with a wild animal and, hmm. and they respond to you. It's really, really something special. So I, I got a, really one year up in uh, Georgia, we were hunting up and I was hunting up in North Georgia and these hens, like I didn't hear a whole lot of hen talking here in, in Florida. I have, but at the time before I hadn't. So when I was up there, the, this hen, I don't know if she was the, the, you know, the whole raspy hen or whatever it was, but she was, given me a lesson and it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. And then, I mean, I just like, it, it was just a great, I, I didn't get her or get him, you know what I mean? But I was like, I got back to camp and I'm like, you guys don't even understand what just happened. Like it was, it was awesome. Or I had one come in so close. I mean, he, he probably was 200 yards away. I got him called in to probably 40, I would say 40, like maybe 60 yards. And then he went silent. Yeah, I know what I did do, wrong. I know what that. I did wrong, but I was shaken. I was like oh, yeah. shaken. I was like, I mean, you know, when people talk about buck fever, this was because I was like, this is it. He's coming around in this food plot. I know it. And um, it's okay, though. It, you know, it was probably one of my most yeah. memorable hunts I've ever had, though. Very cool. Well, we've, we, Mossy Oak, one of my coworkers, came up with a pretty cool slogan, and we got a bumper sticker and a T-shirt that I just bought from our company, and it has just on the T-shirt says, "Sometimes you get the turkey, sometimes you are the turkey." So that's the case, <laughs> and that's probably why I kid everybody keeps going back is because you you lose in turkey hunting more often than you win, uh, and that's what makes it special, and it makes it when you do have a successful hunt it makes it even uh, you know you appreciate it a little more but uh having a conversation with those turkeys and listening to the females in the wild this is really cool my my hunt in florida three and a half weeks ago um the gobbler was way off but i ended up calling three hens into uh where we were hunting and those hens didn't like that i was calling and mm. i mimicked those hens and then when they got in front of me I just shut up and I let them do their thing and they called the gobbler right to me. So that's, uh, you know, what I do is if you, if once you have deep, if once you have hens close to you and they're making all kinds of noise, if you call to them just enough to keep them close there, the real thing is always better than anybody, no matter how good you think you might be. So. I know. I love it. It's awesome just to be able to, uh, get them so close to you. Like you said, you had those hens come in, you brought them in and then, you know, it's just, that's what it's about. Um, so, Heck yeah. so this show's going to have to, we're going to have to come to a close here in a few minutes, but I do want, if you could give a hunter, I always ask just one tip, one tip that was given to you or you learned, what would that be? You know, the biggest thing about hunting, whether it's deer hunting or whether you're dove hunting or whether you're turkey hunting, is is go. First off, go. You're going to make mistakes, and you're going to learn from those mistakes. And the more mistakes you make, as long as you're smart enough not to repeat them, you're going to get better as a hunter and become more successful. But you got to put the time in, and you have to go. Uh, you know, I like I mentioned in the beginning of the program, the old Archibald Rutledge saying how he was just in kindergarten. I still feel that way when I turkey hunt. I went yesterday afternoon and I made a mistake and I realized I made that mistake. And I'm going to go back as soon as this podcast is over. I'm going to completely play hooky, put on my camouflage and head. I got an hour drive to go where I'm going and I'm going to go back to where I went, but I'm not going to do the exact same thing. I'm going to do something completely different and maybe I'll get lucky, but I learned what I learned yesterday for messing up. So I'm on, not, I'm on hopefully not make those mistakes again. So that's the biggest thing is just go. Uh, you're going to make there. mistakes. You're going to make errors. And right now there's never been a better time to learn any kind of aspect of hunting with a resource known as the internet. You can get mm -hmm. on YouTube, you can get there and you can learn anything and you cut the learning curve way down. When, you know, I, I killed my first turkeys in 1995 when I was 17 years old. 
and the resources weren't there. Like everything I had to learn was from VHS tapes and magazines right. and audio cassette tapes on learn how to turkey call. Things are way different now. There's a ton of resources. So a beginning hunter's got a lot more resources and just don't feel intimidated. You know, get out there, get on the internet, learn and state agencies do a really good job. And, um, you know, they got people that they pay to, to, to introduce folks to the outdoors. Uh, our three programs have, uh, you know, from, uh, from learning to, you know, it's, there's, there's lots of different resources, national wild Turkey Federation is a good resource. Local yes, chapters, for sure. A lot of times have mentor, mentor programs. So biggest thing is like, Hey, if you're a first time hunter, my one hunting tip is just go and you're going to learn right. some mistakes. From the words of Jason Hart, we appreciate you so much. Thank you for so much information. And hey, man, I wish you much success on your hunt this afternoon. Go get them. I'll be looking for pictures. All righty. Well, Thank I you. I sure appreciate it, Heather. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. Yeah.